Davis steps under center. Gibson and McClendon behind it. Davis with motion by Richard. Will get the ball to McClendon. He leaps. Oh, he doesn't get in. He fumbled the football. Carolina holds. The game is over. And Carolina has won the game. Ben lead to throw. Over the middle. Intercepted. Wolfuck again. Wolfuck the other way. At the 30. The 40. Wolfuck to midfield. Miles Wolfuck with the pick. The heels on the doorstep of an enormous victory. Left side of the line. Hood standing to Williams' is right. Williams going to throw. One-on-one. Davis has it. Touchdown. Carolina wins. Carolina is the Coastal Division champion. Bernard fields it at the 26. Heading to the far side. Gio at the 35. Gio, he's at the 50. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Gio, he's going to take it. for the possible win. Snap, spot, kick away, high enough, long enough. It's good! It's good! Carolina has won the game on a 42-yard field goal by freshman Hunter Burr. Good gosh, dirty. This is the Heel Tough Blog Hey guys, and welcome in to another edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. It's Anthony Pagnotta, Josh Marlowe back with you. This was supposed to be a video version of the podcast. We were supposed to continue our video versions of the podcast. And while we do have a video up on the page, well, it's a little bit different for this week. Uh, unfortunately, we recorded our video podcast at the job the other day, and uh, for some reason, the audio wasn't turned on in the video. We've had this problem uh, multiple times with uh, some of the other videos that we've shot with the equipment uh, that we were using. So uh, we're going to still try to figure that stuff out, make sure that uh, we'll be ready to go for the next time when we do the show, when we recap the game against Syracuse and uh, preview the game against the Charlotte 49ers. But we're here today to preview the game against Syracuse. Uh, Won't be too long-winded because we, you know, did this, of course, yesterday. So uh, we're going to kind of go through, give you a look at what to expect from Syracuse, what to expect from Carolina. Carolina, and then the matchup uh, between the two teams. We'll also talk about some of our keys to the game and everything like that. But, uh, hey, man, the, the, it's, the best part is, is we finally got here. We didn't think we would be able to get to this point. We'd heard so much throughout the offseason about how, look, you know, there's a really good chance that this season won't be played uh, because of everything that's going on with COVID-19. But finally, we sit here on game week and uh, Keenan Stadium, although it won't be filled with fans that will be loud, it will be filled with fans uh, that are, uh, are in attendance. It's just they'll be cardboard. Yeah, man, it, it feels good to finally be back to game game week. We're, you know, at this point of recording now, we're less than 18 hours away from kickoff. And like you said, even a month ago, we didn't know if we were going to get this a season on, on time. And, of course, it's not on time, but we're still getting a, a college football season. And, you know, it, it's a good thing for many different reasons, but for, but for Carolina – the expectations around the program are as high as they've ever been during you and I's fandom. And it's it's been a lot of fun. That was a fun offseason before COVID kind of put football on the back burner. But um, we're here. There's a lot of expectations in and around Chapel Hill. And it should be a fun football season for Carolina. Yeah, and it starts on Saturday in Keenan Stadium against the Syracuse Orange. And, you know, we kind of touched on this a little bit when we did it yesterday, but I think it's really important for people to realize that if Carolina does come out slow out of the gates in this game, it's possibly because this wasn't an opponent that they knew that they would have to prepare for on their 2020 schedule, let alone, uh, you know, the first game of the season. And uh, the Syracuse Orange last year, well, man, they did not have the type of season that they were 
were expecting before the season last year. We remember sitting there reading through the magazines, just watching, you know, all the conversations on television before the season began. Some people thought this could be the second best team in the ACC. Now here we are as we enter 2020 with Syracuse coming off a disappointing season where not only did they not live up to those expectations, they didn't even make a bowl game a year ago. Carolina, on the other hand, exceeded expectations. So, you know, you feel like coming into this game, Syracuse might have a little something to prove. Yeah, no doubt about it. This is going to be a very hungry team, a very motivated team, because last year was a disappointment. You're coming off a year where you won 10 games. You thought that you were ready to maybe take the next step and challenge Clemson and that upper, and that upper echelon of the ACC. And that just didn't simply happen. The result of that, uh, both coordinators get fired. So Dino Babers making some uh, changes to his staff to kind of get this team and this program back where you want to get to. But despite that, you still lost a lot of talent and some some key parts uh, from your team. And with an offseason where you didn't have a full chance to install these new systems, as, even though they're going to be motivated, they're going to be hungry, they're going to have some bumps on the road as well, just like Carolina will. Well, and look, everything starts on the offensive side of the football with them. Last year, uh, a pretty successful year, especially through the air. Uh, junior quarterback Tommy DeVito, of course, many probably remember him uh, being, you know, a, a guy that played in uh, in an all-star game uh, out of high school. So this guy's very talented. I mean, a 19 to 5 touchdown to interception ratio a year ago. Really had a pretty solid year, but that was when he was able to get the football out of his hands. He took 50 sacks a year ago because his offensive line really struggled. Now this year won't have the type of weapons that he had a year ago around him. Tristan Jackson, the transfer wide receiver from Michigan State, is gone. So that's a thousand yard receiver that he won't have uh, in his arsenal, as well as three running backs. uh, The top three rushers on the team actually from a year ago will not be out there. Of course, loses top rusher Mo Neal, who ends up graduating. And then uh, the opt outs from both Abdul Adams and Jarvion Howard. So, uh, you know, this is something that, you know, for Syracuse and for Carolina, I think that's going to be the main focus for both sides is is just what is this offensive line look like uh, and how are they able to sort of protect the quarterback? And if, that, if they are able to do that, it'll be able to drive this offense. But, you know, this is an area that is a little weak for the Orange entering 2020 still. Yeah, both of them have question marks among the trenches for Syracuse on the offensive side of the football. How do you get better after the struggles last year? And for Carolina, you're trying to replace Aaron Crawford and Jason Strovich, which is not going to be easy, but you get a formidable opponent to where you feel like you have a chance of doing that in this first game to kind of build some momentum. Remember, Velasic has got a lot of uh, praise coming out of camp. He's supposed to take a big step forward. And some of those guys that we have questions on that defensive line, this is a good chance for them to kind of come out, make a few plays, gain some confidence, because this defense, if they're going to take the next step, they've got to get better up front despite the losses, as the aforementioned Aaron Crawford and Jason Strobridge. Yeah, and I think there's definitely a chance for Carolina to do that. Of course, when the depth chart was released the other day, Tamari Fox was the guy uh, that ends up uh, taking over the starting role beside both Jaleel Taylor and uh, Raymond Voasik, who you talked about there. Uh, The only real shock that we saw, Kamen Rucker, is going to be a part of that defensive line, a little bit of a smaller guy on that defensive line. And we were kind of talking through that, saying how, you know, it might be a little bit of an advantage with his speed being pushed inside, maybe trying to get that matchup more often than not with the guard who won't be able to keep up with the speed. So it'll be interesting to see how Carolina is able to get after the quarterback in this game, which is, I think, one of the big keys is, is can they find a way to make Tommy DeVito uncomfortable? Because as you know, we, we know just from being, you know, able to watch him in the ACC, if Carolina is not able to get to him. He's going to be able to find a way to move the football down the field. I, even with the guys that, you know, end up leaving, still got Taj Harris, who's coming back at wide receiver, uh, Nikeem Johnson in the slot, a small speedster. So uh, Carolina does have to be careful with this Syracuse offense. Now, on the other side of the ball, Syracuse's defense a year ago really, really struggled, especially against the pass, allowed 262.5 yards through the air. Uh, that's not really going to be a 
a recipe for success if they're going to find a way to upset Carolina in this one. The Tar Heels have to be able to take advantage of that secondary that struggled a year ago. They do have some playmakers, but ultimately they really weren't able to consistently stop teams, and that could set up for Carolina to have a big day through the air uh, against the Orange. Yeah, I mean, when we broke down the schedule last week, we talked about how this matchup, even though it wasn't originally on the schedule, really favored Carolina starting out and what's going to be this unusual season because there's just so many question marks about Syracuse. On the defensive side of the football, you've got Andre Sisco, who's a great secondary player, but there's a lot of question marks behind him, and they're, they're just not as good in the other areas where you feel like if Carolina can get that push up front, then they're going to be able to have their way. And you mentioned that it's you know this good chance for this offense to have a good day through the air, and that's always a possibility with Sam Howell and the the weapons he has at wide receiver. I still think that if Carolina wants to be a run first football team, and that's what they're going to try to do first is establish the run and let the play action pass bit off of that. And and so that you know, but that's my opinion. Maybe you disagree. I just see this team, even though there's questions more about that secondary. Phil Longo is going to want to get Michael Carter and Javante Williams involved and set the tone early. Well, I think, you know, you always – it's it's hard not to say that you don't want to lean on, on your starting quarterback that is coming into the season off an amazing true freshman year where he set multiple passing records uh, in terms of true freshmen in the NCAA. Of course, set many program records at Carolina. Um, and, you know, I think the, the other thing is, is that if you want him to have a chance at the Heisman, uh, you, you are going to sort of – sort of use your offense in a different way to make sure that uh, he, you know, can can get his touchdowns through the air. And you're still not going to want to take away those big plays that we saw late last year. Uh, but with that being said, though, I understand what you're saying is that, you know, you want to open up that passing game with the run game. And I think, you know, it's, it's going to be kind of a strategic thing. And this is something that really Carolina has not been able to do in recent years because, you know, especially the run game here really since – uh, Elijah Hood left, and, and you had those Elijah Hood, TJ Logan combination backfields, you've really been struggling to consistently run the ball. You know, Jordan Brown, you know, he had his moments. Antonio Williams had his moments. But last year was the first time really since Elijah Hood and TJ Logan where you felt that you could run – and pass to win the game. You, you, if you needed to lean on one heavier than the other, you could still find a way to win. Now, I think the balance is is the ultimate thing because as we talked about when we did the schedule breakdown, that game against Virginia Tech, you know, last year really kind of showed that where they really became pass happy. And in the end, they didn't win the game because even though they had a ton of success through the air, it, it, it became predictable at a point. Um, I think this game, it, it's really key that Carolina got to run the ball because this team last year allowed over 200 yards on the ground in Syracuse, of course. Uh, and now this year, you know, they lose a lot up front. They lose two of their best defensive linemen, including the guy in the middle uh, who started last year, Alton Robinson, who was, you know, really the, the heart and soul of that defense a year ago. And then at linebacker, you're starting two guys that haven't had any significant defensive reps taken in their career, including a guy that is a true freshman, very talented talented true freshman, I'd be that, in Stephon Thompson. But this is, you know, th- that's asking a lot for them to come out against, a, you know, two guys that last year, if Javante Williams doesn't get injured late in the season, he ends up reaching the 1,000-yard mark. Michael Carter, of course, did reach the 1,000-yard mark. So I think in this game, in order to set the tone, and especially because you're going to be dealing with a weird environment, which we'll talk about a little more in depth here in a second, I think – Running the football is where you're going to find your most success, and you've got to take advantage of that. Yeah, I I know I don't I do not disagree with that at all. Carolina, Phil Longo said that the playbook is completely open this year; that everything that they want to do is installed. But Mac Brown has said that he wants his offense to be like Oklahoma's, and everyone thought that meant scoring 60 at, at, at will. And he didn't necessarily mean that, but it's being able to run the ball at will and pass the ball at will. Last year they had moments like that where they could do it, but it wasn't always there. That's the next step for this offense. Outside of getting better in the red zone is being able to do whatever you want 
when you know, no matter where you are in the field, no matter situation, right. you don't want to get put back to in that spot where you said, like at Virginia Tech, where you literally just had to put Sam Howell back there and throw the ball fifty to sixty times. That's not a recipe for success um, in, in in this league. So. Um, I do think they need to be able to run the ball, establish that, uh, that, that that run game. But it starts up front with their offensive line, which has some question marks of its own. But you're oh, you're going to get a defensive line that you should be able to push around more often than not. Yeah, well, the, I mean, that's kind of the good thing for this offensive line. And, and, and the big thing, I think, to realize with the offensive line is that it's really not that much concern with the starters. You feel very comfortable with the four guys that you've got up front outside of a Sim Richards who has to replace Charlie Heck. And even from everything that we've heard from the staff so far this offseason, they like what a Sim brings. It's just he doesn't have the experience that, of course, Charlie Heck leaves behind. But, I mean, you're talking about Joshua Zudu who, you know, again, he struggled the first time we really saw him start a year ago against App State, but he was playing a tackle. Uh, now I think he fits so well at left guard, and he only allowed one sack all the last year, and it was that sack, uh, the sack fumble that was uh, created in the App State game by Demetrius Taylor. Of course, everybody remembers that. But, you know, other than that, he was fantastic. I thought Marcus McKeithen was great. I, I, he's probably, you know, the guy I look at as the leader on that offensive line right now, him along with Jordan Tucker, who, of course, we remember, you know, last year built off of what was a great start against uh, NC State to close the 2018 season. And then, of course, Brian Anderson, who stepped up and played well after Nick Polino went down. So uh, I think, you know, you still feel comfortable with the starters up there. Um, I think, you know, at at the least, you know that that group was able to help you run the football very successfully last year. You still got to protect the quarterback better. We're not talking about Syracuse-like numbers where you let up 50 sacks uh, all in the season. But we're still talking about a team that needs to find a way to protect Sam Howell a little bit better. And with the combination of it, you need Sam Howell to be able to get some of his passes out quicker because there were times where he held on to the ball a little bit too long this year. Um, of course, you know, we know that could change with the fact that they're kind of opening his legs up a little bit more this year. Um, and that could also help them in the red zone. One of the other things, and we didn't really mention this when we talked uh, yesterday when we were doing the show, but I-, I was thinking about this here just a little while ago. I think this game, along with the, the, the next two to begin the season, before you get to that Virginia Tech game, is really an opportunity for you to sort of develop a little bit of uh, – familiarity and a little bit of confidence between quarterback and tight end. That was one thing that we didn't really see a whole lot of last year. That was part of the reason why I think the team struggled as much as they did in the red zone, uh, which, you know, was helped out by the fact that they were able to hit so many long touchdowns. I think teams will be trying to take that away from them this year. So they're going to have probably more red zone opportunities and they're going to need to take advantage of it. Do you feel like this is a stretch where getting Garrett Walston going is key? like I do? I do feel like there will be some set plays to try to get him involved in the offense. When we talked about the offensive side of the preview, I mentioned that that's the one thing that was missing from this offense, and really from Carolina's offense, since Eric Ebron departed under Larry Fedora. They haven't had a guy at tight end that was going to make consistent big-time plays, and I, I, I think I feel like they need that. You need that guy on third downs when people are trying to double team Diami Brown and Daz Newsom. And I and I think you mentioned um, the red zone, which is a great point. That's a lot of times you see in football where the tight end is a is a mismatch nightmare. You've seen the NFL. You've seen it with certain teams in college. If they can get more production from Garrett Walston or whoever was to step up and make plays, it's going to take this offense to another element or dimension. So I do think that you'll see Phil Longo try because you feel like these first three games you've got some leeway to where you can kind of tinker with some stuff even in the second and the third quarters just mm-hmm. to see what works and what doesn't. And you might see that with the tight end position. And then one other thing that I'm kind of glad that we, you know, the first one didn't record, of course, not because we can't be on camera, but I I saw this statement today from Rod Gilmore, who, uh, of course, is an ESPN college football analyst. He said that the biggest concern with this team, and I cannot make this up, is the secondary on this defense. We We have to talk about the secondary because, I mean, you look Storm Duck, Uh, ends up getting a starting job. We knew, you know, there was a really good chance that would happen because he's been the most talked about guy in the defensive backfield outside of Trey Morrison this year. Trey, of course, the starter 
and at the nickelback position with Jaquarius Conley backing him up, which is very interesting as well. And then, of course, the safety spots, Don Chapman and Miles Wolfolk will start, along with Kyler McMichael and Patrice Rene, who are battling uh, to start at that other cornerback position on the outside. And, you know, the depth behind them looks pretty great as well. I don't understand how Rod Gilmore thinks that that's the biggest concern with this team. But, hey, if that's the biggest concern going into this game and throughout this entire season, I think I'll take it. Yeah, if that's the biggest issue with Carolina this year, then they should have no problem winning nine, ten football games because that's one of the areas of this team that you're not really concerned about unless a ton of injuries pile up like last year. You've got Storm Duck, who last year was a budding star. You've got Patrice Rene coming back from injury, Kyler McMichael. Um, we know the kind of talent he possesses. You've got Don Chapman at that secondary spot, along with Miles Wolfolk. I'm not concerned at all about that back four. Dre Bly's transitioned very well into being a coach there. They're going to play with a lot of attitude, a lot of swagger, a lot of confidence to make plays, and I think they're going to. Um, but I, I, I think, like what you said, if, if that's the biggest issue we're worried about with Carolina, it figures to be a good year for the Tar Heels. Yeah, and I mean, we didn't even talk about guys like Trey, uh, or excuse me, Tony Grimes, uh, who, you know, has been, uh, you know, came in extremely highly touted in the 2021 class, ended up reclassifying to the 2020 class so we could get on campus. He's on the 2D. People are really excited about what he brings. Uh, we've heard that DeAndre Hollins has been improving uh, from what the staff has been saying in press conferences. So, man, this team, uh, I, I just, I don't understand what they're thinking there, but uh you know, I think that, you know, when we talk about, you know, keys to the game, uh, I think one of the biggest ones that we discussed is this team has to get adjusted to what will be a very strange environment. Um, it's going to be, you know, we, we, we of course, kind of joked around and said, you know, it's going to be like Duke, um, you know, where, where there's just no fans there. And that's uh, something that, that really isn't a joke. It's actually kind of true and kind of sad. But, um, you know, when we, we talk about this game, I think – the biggest thing for Carolina to do is they have got to be the team that settles into the weirdness quicker. You know, we, we got a kind of a look at it last night in the game between Kansas City and Houston in the NFL ranks. I think it's a little bit different, though, because there were fans there. This one, there's going to be no fans there. It's going to be all artificial crowd noise. But I think that's the big key is who can settle in the quickest here uh, and, and, and sort of adjust to the strange environment. Yeah, I mean, last year Carolina fed off the home environment. It really was uplifting for a team after Mac Brown. That was one of the things when he took the job was, you know, challenging us as fans to be in the stands early, be energetic. We we answered, his, you know, the demand, and it really helped that team. They, they helped to beat Miami, helped us compete with Clemson, helped you beat Duke. Now that's gone. How do you how do you adjust to not having any environment? That's the one thing that makes college football what it is, is that the environment is always better than what you're going to find in most NFL places. You don't have that extra motivate or that extra thing in the in the stands to put you over the top if you're having an off day. I do feel like, though, it's a good thing that – uh, they're, they're going to be more prepared under Mac Brown than they would have been maybe under any other coaching staff to handle this. It, it, it's, it's how I feel. I feel like he's going to have them prepared. They've been going things with during practice because he probably knew all along there wasn't going to be fans. So they're all during fall camp. They were probably preparing for it, but it's still going to be different when you put on that game day uniform and you walk out to an, an empty stadium. Um, and with that, I'll also say that the fact that Roy Cooper is not allowing parents to come and, and be in the stands is an absolute disgrace. Not going to get political on this at all, but that's that's an embarrassment. Um, and it's really just a shame for these kids and these parents who can't see their own kids compete if someone was going to be their final season playing college football. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the way that a lot of people look at it is that, I mean, even if you were able to send one parent to each game, you know, you would be having around maybe, you know, 100, 125 people there, um, you know, for in a in a 50,000 seat stadium where you can spread out. And, you know, there are going to be games that Carolina it, it, is going to travel to this year, um, such as Miami late in the year. Uh, other ones, of course, may open up as the year goes along, but there will be fans in the stands for those games. Uh, Carolina, it seems like, unless there's a miracle 
miracle that happens, they won't have fans in their stands the entire season. So I agree with you on that. But, yeah, we're not going to really go too in-depth on that because we don't want to start getting into uh, the political side of things. That's that's not what we're trying to do here on the podcast. We know there's probably ton, you know, a, a group of people that listen that agree with one side, a group of people that listen that agree with another side. And you know what? That's uh, We're okay with that. That's exactly how it's supposed to be in this country. So, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the last thing we'll, we'll do before we get out of here, let's give our predictions for the game. Uh, we went on there uh, yesterday. I went with uh, 38 to 14. I'm not going to change that. I think uh, that'll be the final score. I think they'll end up uh, holding up the um, or covering the spread in next in the game. And uh, I think, you know, they come out, look pretty good offensively. Um, especially in the run game. And uh, as long as they, you know, continue to show what they showed at the end of the year last year defensively, I think people should be very encouraged. But at the same time, I expect that, you know, if if the score is a little closer, it'll make a little bit of sense because it's a different environment. It's also still the first game of the year. People have to realize that too. Um, But I, I, I have Carolina winning rather handedly in this one. So do I. I win yesterday. I, I said 38 to 17. You didn't change your score. I'm not going to change mine. So I feel I think it'll be the same. I, I think there will be a feeling out phase. But once Carolina is settled in on both sides of the football, they're they're deeper. They're more talented. They're better, well coached. I feel like that's going to prevail, and they're going to get off to a very good start. Which is, it's you know, they're going to need. They need to win right. the game. You don't want to come out starting 0-1 and trying to climb uphill from from that because, as Chris Collinsworth said last year in the NFL broadcast, you lose that opening game for the rest of the year, you're up, you're you're fighting an uphill battle. We don't want to fight an uphill battle in an 11-game schedule. So I think they'll come out and get the job done rather handedly. Uh, all right, yeah, definitely one that uh, we feel is important for Carolina, not a must win out of the gate. We, of course, we're not trying to say 0-1 season would be over, but definitely one that you want to win in a season where you have really high expectations. All right, so that wraps up this edition of the podcast. Of course, next week we'll be back on camera. We're going to make sure that everything is uh, is set up right, exactly the way it is, because we've really enjoyed uh, having you know uh, that sort of – face-to-face type of connection uh, with you guys even. Uh, I know, of course, we're, we're not, you know, talking directly to you guys, but, hey, you know, we really enjoy it. Uh, I think it's been something you guys have enjoyed as well because you guys have shown out. We really appreciate that. Uh, almost 2,000 views on the video uh, from this past week where we did the schedule breakdown. So really appreciate that. Uh, the other video is getting a lot of run as well. So uh, we are extremely excited about the move to video and uh, are glad that you guys have been along for the ride with us. Of course, uh, if you want to get more in-depth uh, prepared for this game against Syracuse, Head over to the website, uh, HeelToughBlog.com. You guys can check it out there. Plenty of great articles on the website that you guys can check out uh, in terms of this game. Uh, you know, we got the Syracuse preview. We got the bowl predictions, uh, which, you know, everything will kind of start with this game. So you guys can check that out. Uh, also, we've got some other stories up there for you guys. Bryson Richardson in the transfer portal. If you guys didn't know about that, make sure you check that article out as well. Um, and then, of course, after the game is over, we'll have you covered. We'll have uh, three days straight of recap articles that'll come out so we'll have the recap that'll come out tomorrow night after the game is over you'll have the uh trench report which will which josh will do he'll take a look at the offensive and defensive lines which uh, especially early on in the season this year will be one of the most interesting aspects of this team and then of course we'll finish it up with the stock report uh and then uh once we do that we'll shift our focus over to the game against charlotte uh we'll be doing uh one podcast Uh, as I mentioned, where we recap the game against Syracuse, preview the game against Charlotte. Sometimes, maybe later in the year, we'll end up doing separate ones. But for now, with everything that we've got going on, uh, on the working front and everything like that, we feel it's best to just kind of concisely pack that into one show for now. But uh, we really appreciate you guys watching this. For the people that are listening, really appreciate you guys listening to this. Make sure that you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you are listening to it, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spreaker, Spotify, wherever it is, uh, we really appreciate that as it'll help us move up some of those uh, those rankings boards, let people that haven't quite found the podcast find it. So uh, I want to thank you guys for watching and listening, and as always, go Tar Heels! Go Tar Heels!